I think Clay handed me this passage in particular because I had mentioned earlier this week that it's a passage that I'm very passionate about. I really like reading through Revelation chapter two and three. If you've read through the book of Revelation, chapters one, two, and three are much easier to understand than the rest of it. Um, and so that might be on one hand why I enjoy studying it as much as I do. Um, but on the flip side, just looking at the content of these seven uh, letters to the churches in Asia, we get such an insight into Christ. It is really one of the only examples that we have of Christ actively speaking outside of the gospel accounts. Um, and so I'll share my screen. We'll hop right into the passages. But we spend so much time in our, in our Christian walk studying the epistles of Paul, studying the epistles of Peter and John, Hebrews and James, and all of those are, are inspired. And so they're just as valuable as these are. Um, but at least personally speaking, there's a little bit of a difference when I read you know, a, a letter that Paul wrote to a church and when I get to see these words that, that Jesus Christ himself um, spoke to, to these churches. Um, if we back up to, to chapter one, we can see that these words are coming from um, are coming from Jesus. These are the, the testimony of, of Jesus. And uh, this message is being relayed to these seven churches, being given to angels who are over these churches. But these words are, are coming from Christ himself. Um, and we don't have time exactly to read through, you know, both chapters, to read through all seven. And so we won't attempt to. But there's one key word that we're going to look at in each of these seven letters. And that's the word repent. I think you guys can see the highlights on my screen. At least I hope you can. Um, but in five of these seven churches, the message being given to them includes this command, repent. And you can make a strong argument that the point of the message is for these churches to repent. The Church of Ephesus is an example that I think we've heard of before. Um, Christ is very complimentary of them at first. He says, I know your works, your toil and patient endurance, and, and says, I know that you do these good things. You can't bear with those who are evil, but you've tested those who call themselves apostles and are not. It all sounds like these positive things. And then in verse four, we see this pivot where Christ says, but I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Maybe a phrase that we've heard before. And it's followed up with this command. Remember, therefore, from where you've fallen, repent do the works you did at first. If not, I'll come to you and remove your lampstand, which is a symbol in Revelation, essentially for their salvation, for their, their status in heaven, their standing in heaven, uh, is their lampstand, their reward that's being given to them. And so if they don't repent, there's this very serious reaction where their lampstand might be removed. We see that the word's not present to the church in Smyrna. Um, and we'll come back to that in just a moment. We see that it is present to this church in Pergamum. Um, there are some mostly negative things, to, to be honest, uh, towards the church in Pergamum, um, perhaps some things that are more positive. Uh, but it says that some people hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. It's not specific on what that is, other than that it is a false teaching. And uh, the message to them is therefore repent. And again, if not, I will come soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. Um, just this negative consequence if the church does not repent. To Thyatira, the, the what, fourth? Yeah, to the fourth congregation being addressed, uh, we see the word repent in three different times. Um, whether literal or figurative, the message is about the woman Jezebel calls herself a prophetess. A lot of people interpret that as another type of false teaching as opposed to explicit sexual immorality. But either way, the command is to repent. Repent of this woman and her teachings, whether it's literal or figurative, the congregation would understand this message, obviously, uh, even if we don't understand it in full. And again, uh, there is this negative consequence if they don't repent. We move into uh, chapter three. The congregation at Sardis is treated no differently. Um, there is a positive reputation and then a negative uh, result. They have the reputation of being alive, but in fact, they are dead. Um, and then it says, remember then what you received and heard. Similar to Ephesus, remember the love that you had at first. Keep it and repent. And so they're given the command to repent. And we see Philadelphia is not given the command 
uh, and similar to Smyrna, we'll come back to that in just a moment. And then finally is the infamous congregation of Laodicea. They are neither hot nor cold, they are lukewarm. And the result of that statement is those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, says Christ. He's saying he loves this church even if they are neither hot nor cold and that they ought to be zealous and they ought to repent. An interesting note, uh, I'm, I'm sure Greg has mentioned this before, um, but the neither hot nor cold, uh, at least when I would read this originally, I had always thought hot was good and cold was bad um, because that's kind of the verbiage that we use today. If you're on fire for Christ, that's a good thing. If, if, you're, you know, if your faith is cold, that's kind of a negative symbol that we have today. But in reality, Laodicea had both hot and cold springs. It was one of the few cities at the time that had both of those and both were good things. Cold water is good for drinking. Um, hot water is good for cooking and medicinal purposes for washing. Both of those were considered good things. And so when the message here is to be either hot or cold, it's saying, do something. You know, it doesn't matter what you're using your skills for, what you're using your, your talents for, what work you're doing as a congregation, just do something. And the fact that they were not doing anything in that sense, uh, they were commanded to repent. But what I want to talk about tonight, um, there was a lot of backstory to get to, to this one point, um, is the two churches of the seven that were not commanded to repent. We know that there has to be two options. One, there was nothing for them to repent for, that they were perfect, and that can be a little bit hard to believe. Or two, for some reason, they were not commanded to repent. You know, despite their imperfections as individuals, despite their imperfections as a congregation, it was not part of their command that Christ had decided to send a different message instead of a message of repentance. And so reading through just a couple verses here, it says, To the angel of the church in Smyrna write this, The words of the first and the last who died and came to life. He says, I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you're rich. And the slander of those who say that they're Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan do not fear what you are about to suffer. And that's the verse that I'm going to highlight as we read through the rest of it. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. And for 10 days, you'll have tribulation. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. And so while the command here is not to repent, while there is no, uh, you know, repentance command, the command that is being given is do not fear for what you are about to suffer. And it, they explain that there is going to be this tribulation. Uh, Revelation can be tricky in interpreting its numbers. Ten might mean ten literal days. It could be symbolic for a larger amount of time. Um, the argument either way doesn't make much of a difference as we explain this passage today, uh, they're ultimately about to go through a really hard time, that people are going to be thrown into prison, people are going to be killed, and the message is to be faithful unto death. These people are facing the worst persecution that, that we could imagine. They are literally being killed for their faith, and so instead of being told to repent, they're being encouraged in this time. And looking at Philadelphia, we can see something similar. It says, to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write this, the words of the Holy One, the true one, the, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. It says, I know your works. Behold, I've set before you an open door, which no one is able to shut. I know you have but little power, and yet you've kept my word and not denied my name. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan, similar to what we read in Smyrna, uh, behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. So there's a very positive message being given to Philadelphia. Uh, and it goes on to say, because you've kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world. To try those who dwell on the earth, I am coming soon. Hold fast what you have, that no one may seize your crown. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it. And I will write on him the name of my God and on the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven and my own new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. And so I think it's fascinating to compare these two situations. Um, they're both about to go through a tribulation. They're both about to go through something terrible. And to Smyrna, 
the message is hold fast. Some of you will be thrown in jail. Some of you will even die, but hold fast to your faith. And to Philadelphia, it's very different. They're about to go through a huge trial, but in verse 10, because he says, because you've kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that's coming to the whole world. So there is this big trial, this persecution that's coming abroad to most of these churches. And yet to Philadelphia, um, the message is that you'll be shielded from this, that you won't have to go through. Uh, and so the command is to hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. It's a similar command to the one in Smyrna to be faithful, uh, to hold fast to their faith. Um, but it's very interesting to see the difference between the two and, you know, potential interpretations that we could take of that today in our lives. I think oftentimes we can be pretty hard on ourselves as Christians and as congregations that we can be pretty tough on ourselves. And there is a lot of room for that. Five of these congregations were given explicit commands to repent. And if we see any inklings of things like false teachings, of uh, complacency in our churches, then absolutely we can flock to these verses and tell ourselves to repent. But especially in times like the last couple months, I think it's easy for congregations to be very critical of themselves when in reality, two of these churches were not criticized when they were given their messages. Instead, they were encouraged. And the main reason why is that they were about to go through these trials. They were about to go through these persecutions. And in the last couple months, you know, obviously it's not close to the, to the same degree that the early church was persecuted, but we've been scattered and things have been difficult and faith at times can be very difficult from home as we are opting into, you know, online worship and it, it becomes so much more of a proactive choice to, to act out your faith on a daily basis. And we are responsible for doing that. Um, but in this time that is a trial, in this time that is difficult, in this time where we're dispersed, I think there's, the second message that we can apply to ourselves as well, looking at the Church of Smyrna, looking at the Church of Philadelphia, to just hold fast, you know, to, to hold fast through this trial. When we come back together, that's when we can start to focus on, you know, being zealous for our faith and, and ironing out any wrinkles that we might have, really being proactive in our events and in our ministries. Um, but especially during these times where it's trial, whether it's you know, a moment like now, or if it's a personal trial that you're going through at a certain point in your life, struggling with anxiety, struggling with depression. I think there are plenty of times, um, you know, two out of seven times, perhaps, if we're putting a ratio to it throughout our lives, uh, where it's totally okay to look at what's about to happen in our own lives, to focus on the trials, the stressors, um, and the, you know, what we have to work through on our own. And I think it's okay to be able to invest in ourselves in that sense, to be able to, like the church in Smyrna, like the church in Philadelphia, to hold fast to what we have and for that to be our full-time job. Because sometimes when faith is difficult around us and when things are difficult in our lives around us, sometimes all that we can do is hold fast to our faith. Maybe not being these, you know, top tier Christians that we see on social media and comparing ourselves to these congregations that have hundreds of ministries that they run all the time. Um, and instead of, of striving for all of these things that we ought to for most of our lives, um, that in these moments of trial, in these moments of tribulation, um, that, that we should feel okay with holding fast to our faith and focusing entirely on holding fast to our faith when that's what is called for.